We we have we have two remote participants, but we are not able to. Uh, I cannot I cannot open the Zoom. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for for being with us. In the meantime, uh, just le le let's let's start our conversation and. Um, They're in, okay, but I cannot, <laughs> I cannot see them. <laughs> I moderate, I moderate in in, <laughs> in the dark. <laughs> okay. Oh, acá Mark tiene todo. Mark soluciona todos los problemas. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. So, uh, so in in respect of the time and, and people that are uh, punctually joining us this um, this uh, afternoon, let me introduce myself. My my name is Olga Cavalli. Uh, presently, I'm the National Director of Cybersecurity of Argentina, and I also do the several other activities uh, in, in my academic uh, side. I am the director of the South School of Internet Governance and University teacher as well. And with me, I have a lot of friends and very well-known and respected specialists that uh, were so kind to be with me this afternoon. Mr. Chris Painter. Chris is... He has been the first cyber diplomat in the world. He's very well known for his work with uh, President Obama. And I, I met him for the first time in IGF in Turkey. And, <laughs> and uh, since then we have been uh, in, in contact and he has been participating in all the schools of internet governance that we organize in countries of the Americas, whether in person or remotely, he's always keen to help us with his knowledge and his presence and all the activities that, sharing all the activities that he does. Uh, with me is my dear friend, um, Claudio Lucena. Claudio is, uh, he's a professor in uh, Universidad de Paraíba in the Northeast of Brazil. We recently organized the South School of Internet Governance there in the beautiful city of Campina Grande where he lives and he is based there. Uh, so thank you for, for receiving us there. Uh, to my right, I have my dear friend Mark Datisgel. Mark is um, he's, he's one of these young jewels of the internet governance uh, space. He is very active in, in ICANN. He's a GNSO council member. And uh, also he's involved in several research activities related with the internet. And I have remote, my dear friend, remote participants that I have. Sandy, Sandy, are you there? Estás ahí, querida? Hola, querida. Hola, Sandy. Uh, Sandy Palma, she's from Honduras. She's the CEO of a non-governmental uh, non organization named Honduras Cibersegura. And she is very active in, in all uh, related with cybersecurity. Also, she has been a student, a uh, fellow of the South School of Internet Governance. And I have Jose. Jose, are you there? Jose, estás ahí? Jose Cepeda, he's a, diplo uh, he's a parliamentarian from Spain. ¿Qué tal? Muy buenos días. Hola, Hola José, José, querido. ¿Cómo estás? José, Muy una bien. pregunta um, in between us. Uh, ¿Quieres hablar en español o en inglés? A mí me da igual, te puedo hacer una traducción no simultánea si preferís hablar en español. Pues la verdad que lo preferimos, yo creo. Ok, ¿Eh? yo, siempre, yo, siempre yo el, idioma, gracia, el idioma lo queremos. Ok, fantástico. No problem. Gracias. So, uh, I, have, I have drafted some questions for my, my dear colleagues and uh, I would like to start with Chris. Chris is now the, the di what's the director, president. CEO, pre president, president, yeah. president of the Global the Forum of Cyber Expertise, and he travels all around the world, um, contributing and organizing different um, capacity building activities in related with cybersecurity. And I have kind of a weird question. How, how do you see the impact of all the activities that you do around the world? Do, do you see that, uh, that it's really changing the cybersecurity um, landscape in the countries that you visit, especially focusing on developing economies, countries that what I see, at least in Latin America, is that priorities are always other priorities. It's not cybersecurity, it's not the main priority, it's usually problems with economics, it's, uh, security, uh, exporting goods, or, or some other problems related more mainly with economy. How do you see that evolving after, uh, through all the work that you do? You, you feel that that has an impact and it's something is changing and, um, and then we can ask some other questions to you.
Uh, really happy to be here with my friend Olga and the other panelists and all of you. Um, well, I shouldn't say no, then I just have to find another job. I just say <laughs> no, I do think it has an impact. And, and I should say that capacity building was one pillar of what I did when we started the office at the State Department, the Cyber Diplomacy Office. And now there are like 45 of them around the world. Some of them are in this room. Uh, and that's great. And that's important to look at this as not just a technical issue, but also as a, a diplomatic issue, as a policy issue. And, and I'd say that as a, even back when we started the office, we were doing capacity building in uh, different parts of Africa, other parts of the world. We um, uh, also focused in the, uh, with the Organization of American States and others. And one of the reasons for that is I think of capacity building in the cyber realm, but really in everything, as uh, the enabler for all, not just to fight all the bad things we see, all the, you know, the threats that are continuing to grow and evolve, but also to enable all the good things we want out of the internet. And more importantly, to your point, Olga, to enable uh, something that every country wants now, which is to seize on digitization and seize on the digital economy and take advantage of this relatively new platform where uh, they all see, you know, you know, this is bridging gaps between communities is always interesting. The security community doesn't talk to the economic innovation community. This was true when I worked in the White House, too. There was a National Economic Council, the National Security Council. They had different views of things, so they didn't always coordinate. And when we did the cyber strategy at the White House, getting them together was itself kind of a Herculean effort because they're just different viewpoints. So if you can message it in a way that both the security people and the economic people understand, which is this enables this digitization, this seizing of the digital economy that you all want to grow your economy, particularly in developing countries, that makes it something where they say, okay, this really is a priority because that's a priority. And if cybersecurity is going to enable that priority to succeed, then we want to be part of this. Then we understand what the, what the end game is, that it's not just a cost, it's something that's going to achieve something. And to get that, you often... You know, for, for this capacity building to work in cyber or anything else, you need real political buy-in. It can't just be, you know, the technical people you're training say, yes, we want more, which is great that they do. But if you don't get the larger political buying, buy-in, it's not sustainable in the long term. You end up doing one-off trainings, one-off things that are great when they're happen, but then five years later, it's lost. So you need to have a sustained effort, get it ingrained in that country, and that's really tying it to the economic priorities as well. And I, you know, I think we've seen that. Uh, you know, the pandemic had a silver lining in the sense that um, countries real recognized how reliant they were on these technologies, that it wasn't optional anymore. And they see it in terms of infrastructure projects, um, water, power, financial. Everything is controlled by cyber, and security is something that will make that more trustworthy and also operational. So the couple things that, that I, I'd say is uh, in Africa, we created a cyber experts group. I think that's having real uh, impact uh, certainly in uh, in the um, uh, Latin American Caribbean region, uh, working through the OAS as our kind of regional hub too. We've been partnering with them. There's been lots of great efforts to build certs. Uh, computer emergency response teams have national strategies, which are the kind of framing policy document. And I have seen real, I think, impact there, which is good. ASEAN countries. We just, uh, I just came from Fiji, where we launched uh, our Pacific hub. So for the, for the Pacific Islands. More and more countries are understanding, and that was with the Deputy Prime Minister of Fiji, so I think, again, that political level was important. We've seen that connection, but we have to you know, sustain this. And, and my organization was brought together to have more, as a community, really, it's supposed to coordinate and make sure we, we put this on a higher level. And we're having a big uh, conference in Ghana, uh, which is a worldwide conference, not just an Africa conference, at the end of November to bring some of these communities together, including the traditional development community, you know, we all know the SDGs, but the cyber community and the development community, again, two separate spheres, and bringing them together is critically important if we're going to make progress. So, so my long answer is yes, there has been an impact. Yes, I've seen it. It's hard to measure these things, but I've seen, I think, real progress in a number of countries as they, I think, create a more, more trustworthy system against all the threats that will help them succeed economically. I think that some some recent events, perhaps related more with uh, ransomware, are showing the value of having a, a resilient infrastructure and be aware and have rising awareness about all these things. And I I, I find find very interesting the link 
that you make with uh, with the development of the economy. If we don't have that infrastructure in shape, that won't happen. So I think this this latest uh, new attacks are perhaps putting this uh, issue more in the in the spot. Yeah, I mean, look. I've been doing cyber now for 33 years, so for a long time I was a prosecutor prosecuting cyber crime cases when no one cared about them back in the 90s, and then, uh, and then you know went to help run the computer crime section. Was at the FBI, the White House, and the State Department. And through that whole time, the the, the cyber people we're not cyber people, but we do cyber stuff. Uh, we would be saying this, this needs to be a priority. And to be sure, in the U.S. Under at the end of the Bush administration, certainly the Bomb administration, because his campaign was hacked into, uh, and now in the Biden administration, it, you know it's it's a priority, but it can't just be one priority of like three hundred, right? Um, when we had the ransomware attacks, where people had to wait in line for gas, where you might not get your hamburger because it went after uh, um, uh, a meat packing plant, where in the Irish healthcare system you might have your healthcare impacted, that makes it a backyard issue it makes it it makes it a political issue and it makes it a real priority and so that's what i've seen not just in the u.s but around the world is more and more this is becoming a priority the other thing is the cyber people are pretty bad at explaining this being the translators to policy people you know um, and we need that translation we can't make this a magic thing it has to be something that they understand this is a geopolitical issue it is a capacity building issue it's an economic issue and we need to put it in those terms uh you know, I remember used to going in, with the exception of Janet Reno as the Attorney General who got this completely early on, on cybercrime. But most senior ministers or cabinet officials for us, you talk about cyber, their eyes would roll back in the back of their heads and go, oh my God, that's a technical issue, I'm afraid of that. They're not afraid of like nuclear issues, and those are really technical. You don't need to be a nuclear engineer to deal with those issues, and you don't need be, to be a coder to understand the implications of cyber and cybersecurity. You need to have some of those people on your staff but you don't need to be. And I think we need to make sure that you know, policymakers can grasp that. And I've also seen that both in the government and in companies. And that's, I think, a real change, too. Thank you. This is why capacity building is so important to build bridges in between techni technical people and, and policy people, which is always challenging, especially technicians and lawyers. <laughs> no? I'm, I'm, I'm an engineer. <laughs> OK. Jose, estás ahí? José, te perdí. Sí. Hola. Sí, sí, sí. Eh, te voy a te voy a hacer una pregunta en español, pero después yo la voy a traducir y después te doy la palabra. Eh, de, de, lo, de los comentarios que me mandaste para este workshop, eh, me pareció muy interesante esta iniciativa que están llevando adelante de estos cascos azules, cibercascos azules. Eh, y si nos puedes comentar un poco sobre eso y también de otra iniciativa de un mapeo de infraestructuras críticas. Ahora lo voy a explicar en inglés y después te doy la palabra y después que hables yo lo traduzco al inglés. Y muchas gracias por estar acá con nosotros. José Cepeda, he is a parliamentarian from Spain and he has been going around the world uh, and he's engaged in a very interesting initiative. Perhaps you, you have heard about, I'm sure you have heard about it. It's a, uh, ¿cómo se dice casco en inglés? Helmet, oh. uh, cyber oh. helmet, cyber helmet, um, and uh, you're involved in that initiative from the United Nations. Jose, maybe you can tell us about that. And also another initiative that you told me is about um, a map about cyber um, critical infrastructures and related with parliamentarian activities. So maybe you can start with the cyber helmet issue. And uh, if you speak uh, in Spanish, then I can translate to the audience. And many thanks for being with us this afternoon, morning, early morning for you in Spain. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Jory Collets, for this uh, meeting, and especially to Olga Cavalli. Thank you so much. Well, I prefer to speak in Spanish because my, my, my English is very bad. <laughs> and, uh, Sounds yeah, good, huh? To... Okay, okay. Well, thank you. Uh, La verdad que, que eh, hablar de, de los cibercascos azules o hablar de los mapas de infraestructuras críticas en España en concreto, para mí es una gran oportunidad, además, en, en este foro eh, mundial. Eh, voy a ir por partes. Voy a hablar primero de España, si os parece, y luego de la parte eh, más internacional o más global. Eh, respecto a España, es verdad que se están desarrollando, siguiendo un poco las, eh, las últimas resoluciones que hemos aprobado la Unión Interparlamentaria, 
una mayor sensibilización de lo que es y una mayor profundización en la idea de lo que son realmente infraestructuras críticas. ¿no? Por ejemplo, ya estamos evaluando de una forma seria que todos los parlamentos sean infraestructuras críticas. Es decir, cuando hablamos también, antes me, me gustaba un poco lo, lo que Christopher ¿no? y Olga hablaban, ¿no? de, de, de la fusión de los puentes entre lo técnico y la política. ¿no? Yo creo que es esencial. Lamentablemente no hay muchos políticos que entiendan técnicamente ¿no? de, de ciberseguridad y esto en muchas ocasiones genera un problema, genera un problema a la hora de, de intentar eh, eh, tomar decisiones. José, voy a, España, voy a, sí. voy a okay. hago, hago, hago el, el, el translate. Uh, okay. So, Spain is, um, he, he will focus first in, in Spain. He, they are developing resolutions, especially with the Interparliamentarian Union, in definition of critical infrastructure. And they are, they are starting to think that the parliaments and the parliamentarians are a critical infrastructure. And also, he finds it interesting, this idea of building bridges in between technical people and policy makers and uh, also the politicians to be involved with the value and the importance of cybersecurity. Uh, si, sigue tú. Perdón que te interrumpo, pues yeah. si no me no, voy a olvidar no, 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 de no. todo. <laughs> Muchas gracias, Olga. Okay. Uh, eh, okay. ¿qué, ¿Qué ocurre? Eh, uno de, los, de los, mayores, los mayores ciberataques los estamos viendo cómo son desarrollados en las eh, instituciones, por ejemplo, locales más básicas. Eh, la mayoría de los ataques que estamos recibiendo en España suelen ser justamente los viernes a las 5 de la tarde. ¿Por qué? Pues porque así tienen todo el fin de semana libres eh, para estar trabajando cuando saben que no hay funcionarios y no hay empleados detrás o, o controlando las máquinas. Debería haberlos, pero realmente no lo hay, sobre todo en las pequeñas instituciones, en las corporaciones locales, ¿no? en los ayuntamientos. Entonces, digamos que desde las instituciones, desde el gobierno de España, se ha desarrollado una infraestructura que desde el máximo nivel hasta el mínimo nivel eh, hay una capilaridad en la responsabilidad a la hora de nombrar, por ejemplo, hay responsables a nivel nacional, pero luego se han creado CISOs, eh, digamos, a nivel autonómico por regiones y luego cada una de esas regiones se encarga a su vez de estar ayudando y controlando a cada uno de los ayuntamientos y de las corporaciones para que toda la estructura institucional esté protegida. Okay, José, thank you so much. I will translate. So, in Spain, they have noticed that most of these attacks are are performed Friday at 5 p.m. So they have all the weekend to work with the infrastructure that they have intruded. So um, the government has started to work with uh, all levels of the um, of the government, which is national, regional, and uh, municipal. ¿Cómo se dice municipal en inglés? Local level. Thank you. Local level. Um, so um, and also establishing um, responsible people, CISOs, uh, responsible people of, of cybersecurity in all of these uh, different levels of the government. Sigue tú, José. Thank you. Eh, y entonces es verdad que, que lo que se ha tomado como decisión es de desarrollar este, este, eh, este escudo eh, institucional para que todas las infraestructuras críticas, no solamente las institucionales, pero sí que desde las instituciones haya la posibilidad de desarrollar un mapa en cada localidad, en cada región y en, y en su conjunto del país, para que eh, no solamente la cuestión estrictamente de las instituciones o política, ¿no? sino que todas las empresas puedan tener un acceso directo a, a esta red eh, y al final incluso hasta cualquier ciudadano que pueda tener algún problema, pues digamos que sepa dónde puede haber una conexión con las administraciones públicas, con los gobiernos, ya sean locales, regionales o el gobierno central del Estado, para proteger a toda la ciudadanía y a todas las empresas y a todos los y a todas las infraestructuras que, que dependan directamente del gobierno. Oh, oh, sea, uh, so the, the main, it's like a map of critical infrastructure uh, of all the country. So everyone knows uh, companies, organizations, government, uh, also the individuals. They know where to go and what to do if they have an incident and how to try to solve it and where to connect. Thank you. Bueno, y si te parece, ahora vamos a hablar de los cascos azules, cibercascos azules, ¿no? En fin, eh, como bien sabéis, eh, 
Me ha tocado estar trabajando durante eh, algunos años en la elaboración de un informe mundial, precisamente a nivel institucional para la Unión Interparlamentaria, y este informe está siendo analizado y debatido en eh, las reuniones eh, que están teniendo ad hoc sobre cibercriminalidad y ciberterrorismo, una, una comisión ad hoc que se, ha, se, ha se está desarrollando para supuestamente en un futuro, eh, que la previsión es que haya uno o dos años, eh, hacer una gran cumbre mundial en Naciones Unidas sobre la eh, ciberseguridad. Eh, se denomina mejor cibercriminalidad, cibercrimen, bueno, ciberterrorismo y ciberdelincuencia en general. ¿no? Y es verdad que en ese, en ese contexto surgió la idea de buscar que Naciones Unidas se convierta en un paradigma de la ciberseguridad también. ¿no? Si, si lo es de la seguridad a nivel mundial, ¿por qué no también dotarla de recursos, de medios, para que sean también un poco los, los líderes que, sobre todo, como comentaba también Christopher, no hay algunos lugares del mundo donde eh, es, está muy lejos la ciberseguridad. Por ejemplo, en África, ¿no? eh, hay algunos lugares de Asia remotos, algunos lugares de, de, de África. Eh, es importante que al final, como en una pandemia, cuando hablamos de ciberseguridad, todos los países tengan unos mínimos recursos para protegerse. Y es verdad que Naciones Unidas ahí puede hacer una gran labor. Eh, por eso nuestra propuesta va dirigida a que si ya existen los cascos azules como una estructura ¿no? de Naciones Unidas, también para salvaguardar las decisiones del Consejo de Seguridad y salvaguardar y evitar que haya conflictos que vayan a más, como lamentablemente últimamente estamos viendo en todo el mundo, pues eh, nuestra propuesta iría porque Naciones Unidas desarrollara, eh, más aún si cabe, el cuerpo de los cascos azules en un área tecnológica que pudiera dar cobertura a todos los países del mundo. Thank you, Jose. This is challenging. It was a long one. <laughs> so, okay, you, I will do my best. Uh, so um, they have been thinking about this concept. Of, uh, Mark is translating everything in the chat, so he's so fantastic. Um, so this the, the exists this concept of the blue helmets that are taking care of security and organized by by United Nations. So the, he it has been working with the Interparliamentarian Union to uh, promote the creation of a, a, a summit in the United Nations focus on cybersecurity, cybercrime, uh, with uh, this uh, United Nations paradigm focus on, on, on security, why not having cyber helmets for cybersecurity, as they have already cyber uh, normal blue helmets to try to help uh, bring in security to all different places in the world. So the idea would be to develop this concept of cyber helmets in uh, in this summit that would happen in one or two years. Espero no haberme olvidado de nada. Creo que no, dije, perfecto, creo perfecto. que dije todo. Me estoy recibiendo de traductora <laughs> no simultánea. <laughs> <laughs> maravilloso, maravilloso. Traído fantásticamente bien. Gracias. <laughs> eh, algo más que nos quieras comentar por ahora. Después vuelvo con alguna otra pregunta, José. No, en principio nada más. Eh, muchas gracias y, y siento un poco el, todo este doble trabajo que te estoy encomendando. No importa, sí, así aprendo más. <risa> eh, no, no está mal tu inglés, te voy a decir que por lo poco que escuché estaba muy bien. Eh, muchas gracias. Sandy, ¿estás ahí? Sí, querida. Hola, hola querida estás? Sandy. Ahí te veo. Oh, qué bonito el fondo. Hola. Eh, ahora me enganché hola, con estás? el español. I have to switch to English, Sandy. So sorry. Um, but your English is very good, so I'm, I'm sure that you will handle it very well. Sandy is the CEO of a, a non-for-profit organization in Honduras. Honduras is a country of Central America, and she has been very, very active, apart from the fact that she has been one of the students of our school several times. She was in Buenos Aires last year, and uh, she's a good friend of our, our, our group and our community. Sandy, how do you see the situation in Central America? Um, we, we see, especially I, I see all these immigrants going through Central America, trying to reach United States, going through borders. I don't know how does that this has an impact in, in, the, in the infrastructure, how these people handle the situation. How do you see the situation in, in Central America in relation with cybersecurity? How do you see the, the capacity building in bringing a difference in that region? And thank you very much for being with us. Today, it's, uh, what time is for you? It must be the middle of the night. Thank you for um, that. Sí. 
No, igual que José, voy a hablarte en español porque mi inglés tampoco es tan bueno. Eh, okay. Sí, aquí son las 12.40 okay. de la madrugada, así que es un honor. Pero no, no te preocupes, no me he estado todos estos días en el mismo horario. Eh, eh, te voy a pedir, voy a hablar en español, así que te toca traducir también. Me toca, pero entendiste lo que te dije, ¿sí? La pregunta, ¿sí? Eh, okay. Sí, sí te la entendí, no, no hay problema, pero prefiero en español. Ok, en Centroamérica, te digo, eh, en, estamos a, como en pañales, estamos a la, las capacidades de las, eh, de, profesionalmente somos muy pocos en el área, así como a nivel mundial, los informes te indican que te, hay gran necesidad de profesionales especializados en ciberseguridad, sin embargo, eh, son muy pocos las universidades en la región que te permiten o tienen incluida dentro de su currícula la temática. No, no sé si paro o sigo otra. Eh, un poquito más y ya después traduzco. Ok. Eh, en cuestión de, a nivel de ciberseguridad, eh, como todos saben, incluso uno de nuestros países hermanos en eh, Costa Rica sufrió un, uno, unos ataques de ciberseguridad muy fuertes a nivel de gubernamental. Sin embargo, no es la excepción. Eso ocurre a diario en todo Centroamérica. La diferencia es que no se hacen públicos. Esto ocurre a nivel privado, en el sector privado y a nivel también público. Pero no hay, como no hay un ente rector, no existen políticas, no hay leyes que hablen de la temática, entonces no se hacen públicos. Y todos los afectados se dan cuenta solo cuando el ciudadano utiliza una red social para denunciar que fue víctima eh, o sus datos fueron eh, violentados de una institución privada o pública. En caso contrario, no se hacen públicos, oiga. Pero sí tenemos una gran eh, brecha que cubrir en temas de ciberseguridad. Ok, thank you, thank you, Sandy. Uh, um, Sandy is saying that the region has a lack of professionals in cybersecurity, which I think it's a problem all over the world. And many professionals from developing economies are moving to being captured perhaps by, by other uh, countries demanding the, the capacity of these uh, professionals. They have a high necessity of uh, infrastructure. No, few universities have programs to train, um, and this is something that I want to, to speak with, um, with Claudio in a moment. Few universities have um, um, careers focused on cybersecurity, and a country in, the, in, in Central America, Costa Rica, we all know they have really suffered a very, very strong uh, high ransomware attack that practically Im immobilized the government for, for several days. Uh, so uh, she she said something very, very interesting that I have been thinking about after I heard something in the school in Campina Grande. Nobody talks about what is happening. Uh, the only way that uh, people get to know about attacks is through some citizens uh, explaining that something is happening in social networks. This is something complicated. And someone in the school said something very interesting, that the aviation industry uses all the information of every, uh, every event, uh, uh, unfortunate event, like an accident, to improve the, um, the security of airplanes. And now we all know that it's safer to go in an airplane than crossing the street. We all know that. Uh, but that's, that is because and thanks to all the information that has been provided and captured after something wrong is, is happening. So um, someone said, I, don't, I cannot recall who said that in the school, and I said, why don't we find a way to capture all the details of the attacks? Um, perhaps taking away the name of the institution or bank or organization or country that is being attacked, but using all this information to really try to improve and uh, advance the, the way that the to solve or to be resilient. Eh, perdón, eh, porque me entusiasmé contando una historia que escuché en Brasil, eh, Sandy, así que ahora te doy la palabra de nuevo. No sé si te, te entendiste lo que, lo que comenté, que me pareció muy interesante de la industria de aviación, de capturar toda la información para ir mejorando eh, cómo resolver ataques. Eh, ahora la palabra es tuya. Ok. Eh, bueno, mira, a, aquí la, en la región nos ha tocado a, a, en todos los sectores ser resilientes e incluso durante la pandemia eh, se miró el crecimiento exponencial de los ciberataques, eh, especialmente al sector 
academia, ¿no? Eh, tomando en cuenta de que estos tuvieron que cambiar su modo, su forma de, de enseñanza que tenían décadas de utilizar y la tuvieron que cambiar en 30 días, pasarse a la virtualización. Y muchos eh, de estos eh, centros académicos, tanto de todos los niveles, desde preescolar hasta superior, fueron víctimas de ciberataques. Entonces, ¿qué es lo que ocurrió? O sea, no, esto no paró. Las universidades no pararon, los colegios no pararon, pero sí tuvieron que ser resilientes en ese aspecto y empezar a implementar políticas, normas y protocolos a nivel interno. Aunque nuestros países no tengan una estrategia nacional de ciberseguridad, una política nacional de ciberseguridad, o incluso el ejemplo más claro, si ustedes ven al historial de eventos como este, como el IGF, y miran cuántos eh, representantes de gobierno se han registrado o han participado de Centroamérica, se van a dar cuenta que solo hay uno en los últimos cinco años. Una sola persona representante de tomador de decisiones. ¿verdad? Yo he participado, trabajaba en el sector, trabajo en el sector gobierno, pero no soy una tomadora de decisiones. Están los ministros, están los cancilleres, están los mismos presidentes y nadie ha participado. ¿Y quiénes crean las políticas? Son las autoridades de gobierno, ¿verdad? Entonces, a, ahí se mira eh, algo muy importante, que tenemos que crear conciencia. Y para lograr eso, Olga, va relacionado con algo que tú me indicabas en las preguntas que me enviaste. Eh, ¿Qué hay que hacer? Bueno, o sea, ¿cómo, cómo, ¿cómo lo vamos a hacer? Y esto no se logra de ninguna otra manera si no creamos concientización por medio de la educación, formación de los servidores públicos, de los usuarios, de las personas. Y esto no es fácil de lograrlo. O sea, desde lo que te decía, eh, la academia tiene que incluir en su currícula educativa hablar de temas de ciberseguridad, así como hablamos de ética, de matemática, de ciencia. Tenemos que hablar de ciberseguridad y la ciberseguridad no solo es ético, sino son leyes, derecho informático, más y más. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, she really explained very well how the academia moved to the virtual uh, activities during the pandemic, and they had to develop their own internal policies because some countries in the Central American region, as per she's explaining, they don't have a national cybersecurity um, strat strategy or perhaps they don't have the, the policies in place. So the different organizations have been organizing themselves in having their own internal policies. And she talks about the lack of participation perhaps in, in this fora uh, of um, governmental officials or people that are involved in, in developing policy especially from Central America, and the importance of um, a, a war, uh, a rising awareness and education of public servants uh, and, and the lack of activities in the academia. Uh, Sandy, can I give the floor now to, to, to Claudio because I want to follow up uh, a question to him in relation to what you have been saying. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, Chris wants to make a comment in between. Yeah, so it's interesting, uh, this idea of doing something like the Nat National Transportation Safety Board does for airplanes in the U.S. And actually, this is something I think our Department of Homeland Security, I'm no, no longer the government, the Department of Homeland Security has done is they have this uh, action board to look at major cyber incidents. They have a number of luminaries on it, uh, Jeff Moss, our friend, and others who uh, – look at things and try to learn and, and have reports on it. So it's still in its infancy, but that's exactly what they're trying to do. Uh, yes, but uh, what, what we notice, at least in Argentina, um, is that uh, in general who has been attacked doesn't want to say because of different reasons. Because the it's if it's a bank, they want to keep uh, their reputation uh, for the for their customers. They don't want to that the customers uh, go away to other bank because they think that their deposits will disappear. Or if you're a government um, y or, or government um, or agency, perhaps you, yeah. yeah. So uh, the but, the but that's been true for like uh, 30 years, right? And, and, it, and I think it's changing a little bit because now. In certain parts of the world, there are disclosure laws. If there is a breach, they have to disclose it. Uh, securities regulators, like the, S the Securities and Exchange Commission, are saying if you're a publicly traded company and this is a significant event, you need to disclose it. Uh, Europe has uh, laws they're passing now as part of their package of laws. And, and I always used to say to companies who didn't report it, and same with government, better report it and get it out of the way, and people will understand that you're on top of it 
then it be found out like a year and a half later, then that then you risk more uh, reputational harm, I think. But it's still a challenge, I agree. I think it's challenging. I think it's it's uh, it's a process that it's starting to be more more transparent, but we still have a kind of a lack of transparency in in general to to learn from from experience. Uh, Claudio, uh, Sandy mentioned something that I think it's really important: the role of universities. Um, there are few universities that really have a career in cybersecurity. As far as I know, there is one university in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, the Universidad de ¿Cómo se llama Adri? De, um, la de Pablo. La de Pablo. No. Eh, bueno, ya me va a venir. Este, no, 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 no. Bueno, ya me olvidé. I cannot remember the name of the university. They have created one uh, career on cybersecurity. They have a, a very high demand of, of students. It's not virtual yet. It's still for some demands of the, of the bureaucracy, local bureaucracy of universities, but they, they plan to go virtual. And how do you see the role of universities? Uh, because um, I, I've been a university teacher for 20 years, and it's I teach these issues to my students, but as as part of not not part of the formal program. I do I, I share with them information, try to motivate them to learn about these things, but it's not really in the formal program of of the career that they that they do, which is uh, in general informatics. How do you see that being? Um, as someone so much involved in this process and being a university teacher. Thank you very much, Olga. Uh, thanks for the invitation for the space, and thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, that's a very good question for which I obviously do not have the answer. I do not have the truth, but I might have a suggestion of a path to follow, and I think it, it, it's, it should be based on at least three pillars. The first one is uh, we have, from the academia, we have to acknowledge that the, the presence of the digital ecosystem is much more it's much more different now than it was 33 years ago when Chris started. I think that's that's a very good starting point in scale and in nature. I'll elaborate a little bit on, on it a little bit more. Second, the university has to understand its role in the process. And it's difficult to make universities change. University professors who are here are, are start already starting to laugh. So <laughs> uh, and the third uh, it should be uh, for universities to understand that traditional approaches, such as courses, curricula reform, as Sandy was mentioning uh, to us, might not be good enough. It might not be enough for the amount of the, of the challenge that we have. On the first point, uh, back in, let's say, 20, uh, 2005 in, the, in, in Tunis, and when the IGF started, there was, cybersecurity was already an issue. So there were critical infrastructure, there were particular professions that were concerned about it. It's, it was important, but still a niche thing, if we could say so. Fast forward uh, 15 years, and now visiting a temple in Kyoto during the IGF might raise cybersecurity concerns. So it's not only the scale, it's the nature. I've written a paper during the pandemics uh, that was an uh, uh, initiative from the Latin American office of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. And we, we, would, we were trying to analyze cybersecurity aspects of what happened after the pandemics in, in the scenario of Latin America. And there was some data that I collected from a, a, a friend from the University of Chile that struck me uh, absolutely. Uh, he, he, he mentioned that by February in the COVID time, by before the COVID, right? Before the, 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 uh, the declaration of the pandemics, 0.6, 0.6% of the Chilean population had some online activity connected to labor. 0.6% of the Chilean labor, labor force was somehow connected to working online. If uh, he measured then it again in April, three months later, the, percent, uh, the percentage had risen to 5.6%. And he measured it again in July. The percentage had risen to 18% of the Chilean population doing some kind of regular activity connected to work. It's not cybersecurity, but it's attack surface. It's, it, it's a, a, an aspect of people that had not been online yet, and it's a personal digital transformation that accelerated a lot. So that is to, to end this point is to say a lot of our life, it's not a, a niche thing, it's not an aspect, it's not a fraction of the human lives. Cybersecurity is an embedded aspect, an embedded dimension of everyone's life that touches, a, it's a backyard issue. So I think this, this consciousness is not obvious to universities. 
And the second and third points, I think they're they are together. Uh, and, I, and this, I speak m a little bit more from a global south perspective in public universities, to be very uh, specific, because those are institutions that, ha institutions that have a different role uh, in, the, in, in the global south. They have a different outreach. They, they, they are able to work on that uh, awareness. Uh, and as I say, f bringing you numbers, Sandy here brought a deficit of, of cybersecurity professionals. I have an estimate of around 300,000 uh, professionals that are we lack today around that mark can uh, confirm that 300,000 professionals in Brazil only we do not and we will not fill that gap with regular courses reforming curricula formalizing this for one because the university simply does not do that we do not reform curricula overnight or depending no. on, on, on it that takes it's forever yeah <laughs> so thinking about other alternatives, but the university and the academia in, 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 in general, and in the global south, it happens a lot. They have a, re uh, we have a huge mobilizing power, community engagement. So through other alternatives, we can try to hit one of those aspects. And I can bring you a, a good practice from my university, Paraiba State University, which is the UAMA, uh, in, which is stands in, in Portuguese for uh, elder for the uh, Open University to the Elderly. I think it's something we discussed over the over the SIG. It's a program. It's a f formalized program in the university uh, that is directed to the elder, 60 plus people. We include various a the a the asper the idea of the program is to bring them back to the university and make them do interesting things in life again. So they have language classes, uh, health for their age human rights notions, and then last year, in the beginning of last year, because they have suffered a lot in their personal process of digital transformation, that was a segment of the population that was, that was hitting hard. So the, the director of the program asked me, if he found this uh, law school and said, why can't we prepare a cybersecurity course for this people, 60 plus? And I, th I thought the, idea, the idea was just brilliant. And then I thought, uh, uh, looking at stakeholder-wise, and it seems like that for children, we're very much concerned. They learn how to grow up in, the, in, in this environment. We help them navigate. It's pretty much taken care of. It's far from being solved. They're far from being safe. But it's pretty much taken care of. For us, we manage, right? We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll get around. We can, we'll we get around. But it seems that for 60 plus, we have just forgotten them. Yeah. Just left them on their own. And they do not instinctively act adequately and appropriately. And the results of that first semester of two groups with 30, 30 people was absolutely amazing. How much engaged, how much more aware they were, how much they more they were uh, able to defend uh, themselves in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in this uh, environment. Because then again, w the, and I close here, the cybersecurity uh, dimension that we have to, to tackle today is not only institutional anymore. Uh, it's not only collective anymore, it's also on an individual basis. And I think universities have a, an incredible role that can play in this, provided that they meet these three aspects and, and, and understand those uh, three criteria. It's interesting what you mentioned, because at the uh, w w where I work in the directory of uh, cybersecurity, we're promoting a, some papers that we're writing. And I, I did write about uh, old people, because uh, I experienced that with my mom. And she had uh, Facebook, and she used. Um, uh, she died two years ago, but she she used a lot of uh, social networks, and she tended to believe that everyone was uh, thinking like her because all the people were her friends, <laughs> and I, I, it was fr very difficult for me to explain to her that that was not the whole universe of the of the connected world. And um, sh yeah, she was very vulnerable uh, about the, the information that re received, the what she read, and I think that's a target that it's totally forgotten, and uh, I agree with you, and so that I, I wrote something about that. So uh, now I will go to my dear friend Mark. The, he has been so kind to do the translation in the chat of the of the Zoom room when I was translating into English and Spanish, uh, which is my new profession now. Uh, Mark is uh, very active in the GNSO. GNSO is one of the of the spaces of participation of ICANN. ICANN is the organization that gathers all the different, uh, millions of different uh, networks in the world together through some unique identifiers. And um, 
one of these unique identifiers is the domain name system. And Mark has been working very actively in a work, uh, working group about uh, security in the domain name system. So um, why don't you share, Mark, with us w w what is that and how does it affect the cybersecurity and what is what what us should be should know about that and how people can learn about it. And thank you for your participation here. Thank you so much, Olga. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Um, I will try to be that guy that is the bridge between the technical and <laughs> and the normal. <laughs> so <laughs> l l let's give this a try. So when we talk about the domain name system, we're talking about pretty much anything that resolves using that system. People don't think about that, but when you're using WhatsApp, it is using the DNS, you just don't see it. So the domain name system actually operates most of the internet as we know it. So it's one of the only, one of the few shared resources that we really have in the world that are truly global. And that's why caring for its security should be a priority. The problem is, and we have uh, people here in the room who are very active in ICANN as well who can um, say I'm wrong or right, but for a long time this was not put as a priority. This was put as something important to be looked into and certain aspects of security were maintained, but that was on the very, very deep technical level at the security level of the protocol. So it's like, how secure is the technical part of the DNS, right? H is it running smoothly? Can it be tampered with? That was the concern for a long time. But as we see an increasing amount of cyber attacks, um, different I types of initiatives that really seek to harm users around the world, then we had to expand the conversation a little bit. Uh, who are the actors who are using the DNS to do things that are simply not sec secure, simply do not fulfill the mission of the DNS, which is being reliable, secure, and available for all? And there are some cases in which we arrived at that simply do not have a positive use. So the operation of a botnet, there are no good botnets out there. There's nobody doing n charitable, nice things with a botnet. It's always criminals and always of the worst kind as, as well, m might I add. So why are we allowing these people to make use of the system that is a global good um, to leverage this for their attacks, right? That was the sort of question that started this this working group, this process that, that I chaired. And the reality is that there are a few categories of questions that we arrived at that we believe are not good uses of the DNS. And as a working group, we recommended that to the people who run the systems of the DNS. So we're talking here about the registrars and registries, which are basically the people who either have custody over a certain uh, suffix, like say dots um, ninja, or they sell those domain names using that suffix. And we approached them and said, you know, we think that in this very specific, very narrow use cases, this cannot go on. So we settled into a list that is basically botnets. So for those who don't know, it's basically leveraging machines from around the world to carry out a concerted attack or to carry out a disruption uh, in mass. So phishing, which is sites that impersonate another institution or another organization and use that to steal credentials from users. Um, malware distribution, so it's sites that only exist to perpetuate malware. So th there is no other use for that domain name other than spreading a virus or, or an attack or being a bridge for an attack. There's nothing else there other than that and farming, which is when a website only exists to collect information of users for malicious purposes. Um, there's also a addition to that, which is spam, but when I mention spam, you shouldn't really think about it that way, because it's spam as a vector to the things that I said before. It's very specific, right? So this is not about fighting spam, which might have legitimate uses, this is about fighting spam that leads a user to a malware website, right? And this has been presented to these operators. And so far, what we think is that they agree with us that this is something that would be desirable, that it would be better for the internet if they adopted 
these changes to block these specific use cases. So the term that we use is DNS abuse, but if we are to be very, very accurate, it's technical DNS abuse, right? We're talking, so um, intellectual property infringements, anything that has to do with honor or anything like that, any anything that's content is, is not gonna be touched upon by that because ICANN has a technical mission. What we're trying to fight is some forms, this is not even all forms, right? We didn't uh, actually arrive at all forms, but we arrived at some forms that malicious people use to leverage the DNS in a, in, in a negative way. And we are now in very deep into the negotiation of this being a standard. For the entire world, no. So it is for generic names. Um, the country codes, they operate under their own rules. Um, we hope that some of them adopt this or, or want to talk to us about this or think that this is a good idea. Um, but this is each nation's prerogative. Um, so our expectation is that within the next year or so, um, this will come to be, the, these new rules will come to be, and with that we'll be able to add a little bit extra security to the internet. It's not even like the tip of the iceberg, but we are hoping that at least we can show that we, we are actually looking into this, that this is not a non-issue and that we understand that there are very, very bad criminals leveraging um, this public resource for um, things that it should not be used for. So that's the general idea. Um, if you anybody is more interested in this, I can offer more technical material, but this is the, the overview, sort of. So thank you very much for your attention. Mark, this is an issue of operators only, or global cities, uh, individuals can have a say or do something to prevent that it's uh, can i can i do something against the dns abuse or just have to suffer it and and hope that my operator or my registry and register do something about it how do you think so as part of this um, that's a actually a very good question uh, as part of this agreement we are also upping the requirements for what these operators need to include um, in their contact forms before it was ver very much like whatever you want, right? They needed to have some form of reporting available on their website. So you go to a, a big register, I'm not gonna cite names, but like um, a, a big register that sells a lot of domain names, right? And you have identified that they are the ones operating a malicious domain name. Right now, if you go there, you don't, it's not very clear where you can report something, uh, but that's gonna be standardized. It's gonna go into the their contracts that they need to have something that's actually, the user can get there and say, hey, I noticed that this website is a phishing operation. It's copying this website, I have the proof, here are the elements, here's the proof of this, here are the comparisons. And this will enable people who are looking into the system to verify that's not an automated thing, it's never gonna be that. It's literally a way for you to communicate with um, these operators very directly. At the end of the day, it's still their call but we are making an effort so that people actually can report these things. So supposing your your business was cloned and you're currently suffering an attack from that, um, now you can report that uh, at, a, at the international level, which, you know, I think it's a big win. Um, but, you know, uh, opinions may diverge, but still, uh, I, I consider it a win. Yeah, that's an event that we usually see in the National Sea Cert and uh, People uh, are having problem with with domains. Okay, we have like eight minutes. Any comments, questions uh, from the audience? Yes, uh, there's a mic there. Can can you go to the mic? Uh, and can you tell us your name and where you're from? Thank you. My name is James. Oh no, my name is James. I'm from Cameroon. So my question go to Chris, our star, the man in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, quite frankly, I'd like to understand the difference between digital diplomacy and cyber diplomacy. Oh, that's Thank a, you very that's much. A slight difference, eh? Uh, yeah, please, yeah, we don't have much time. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Paloma. I'm from Northeast of Brazil. Um, I would like to congratulate the panel. Um, these speeches were wonderful and necessary. Of course, you. then my question, especially uh, taking Cloud's speech about the digitalization of personal life and the attack on individual base 
and in your speech, I forgot your name, sorry, when you told us that everybody's using DNS while we are using WhatsApp, but the most people don't see it or about phishing cases, something like that. Well, it became clear that cyberspace is an intrinsic part of the development of any country, okay? Uh, a strong cyber capacity is crucial for states to progress and develop in economic, political, and social spheres. Uh, the need to integrate cyber capacity building and development policies ha has been documented by the academia and the policymakers and the other sectors uh, from society. The investment in securing cyberspace affects the success rate or other policy initiative as well. However, uh, there is a clear need for a deeper dialogue with the development community and received countries in order to better to understand how to implement cyber capacities in practice in order to achieve broader development goals. Uh, so to stimulate the debate um, on cyber capacity building and its impact on social and economic development worldwide, I'd like to understand your opinion about the contribution, your opinion about the contribution of digital education to this issue. Uh, since digital education involves not only learning how to use platforms and tools, uh, but also involves the critical and reflective use of the internet and its possibilities and is capable of, in long term, of course, uh, preparing a society for life in a cybernetic context. And I'm including this topic at the debate because um, I think that it's a thing it's something really important when we are talking about administrative risk, or better, we are talking about to define what kind of risk I'm able to support, and to know that I need to understand which are the risk, risks and the impacts in my society, business, or whatever. I don't know if I made myself clear, but that's my question, contribution to the panel. Thank you. Okay, my name is Jim Sinolufui. Uh, from uh, Abuja, uh, Nigeria. I have a comment and then a question. Uh, first to Chris, uh, on the issue of uh, connecting uh, say cyber security to development. Uh, last year, UNECA sponsored a research uh, program uh, which was uh, released at the IGF in Ethiopia. Chris, you were there, and I had the privilege of actually conducting that research. And we're able to really measure it, uh, measure maturity, cybersecurity maturity to development uh, as a way of uh, persuading uh, leadership, policymakers to see the connection. Uh, in that study, a 10% increase in cybersecurity maturity could yield between 0 0.66 and 5.4% increase in the GDP per capita. And that used data from Africa, uh, Asia, and uh, Latin America. So it's available on the website, at least some of the data available on the website, www.cd4ir.africa. So you can check it there. Then secondly, oh, where is Mark? Okay, the, the Mark question is for Mark. Trying to get more minutes for us. Okay. <laughs> okay. Mark, Mark, okay, Mark talked about uh, a DNS uh, with uh, WhatsApp. Uh, I want him to uh, expatiate further. Uh, because there is what we call the OTT. A number of these OTT, they don't really uh, need to depend on all the uh, root system. So uh, I want to expand on what you mean by even using WhatsApp. You know, there are a lot of OTT over the top uh, uh, application. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christine Mujimba. Uh, I work with the regulator, communications regulator in Uganda and we operate as such there for the communication sector. So um, information sharing indeed is, uh, like Olga said, there's re reputational risk, and so especially the financial sector tends to keep it back. But what we have, what we have done is to have an awareness of the CEOs of companies so that they don't see this as a technical issue and they begin to invest in it. But I'm curious to know about investment in tools. We are talking about capacity building, but we need the eyes to know what's happening. And that is really very, very expensive. And in developing countries or emerging economies like we are talking, it cannot be, uh, uh, it's not affordable and sustainable. So I'd like to hear from the panelists what is being done in that area. 
the other when mark mentioned uh, and i appreciate the issue of uh, botnets and, and 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 them only being malicious but i know that there are use cases of ai in terms of the cyber intelligence arm um, so where is the balancing act when they are deployed for those uh, purposes especially since you said you have a list i don't know if it's a black list or a white list and then lastly on the cyber certification um Again, this is very expensive, and yes, there is a deficit of cybersecurity experts. So what level are you looking at? Just the basics like how you taught as a child to, clo to, to look left, right, left, right before you cross the road, not to share your pin, things like that. Is, that. is it at that level, like with the elderly, or is it at a higher level? Thank you. Okay, we, we have running out of time. I'm so sorry. Next year, I will book one hour and a half. <laughs> I, I promise. My proposal is that we find a moment outside. Do you have five more minutes? Uh, uh, we can, we maybe you can respond quickly and, um, and, then, and then we have to, yeah, we have to cut off the, the queue. I'm so sorry for that. Those were all great questions. Um, Digital diplomacy and cyber diplomacy, they're similar. I think digital diplomacy has often been the economic aspects and telecommunications where cyber was the larger cybersecurity, geopolitical issues, but I think they're merging. I think that I'd say that. I think um, uh, the question about, you know, I, I agree bringing the development community and the cyber community together is critically important, and that's what our conference in Ghana is trying to do, what a lot of our efforts are trying to do. Um, I thank you on, on the, the, uh, the GDP issue. That's an important one that shows actual impact of uh, this work. And I think that helps drive decision maker and money and funding, which is scarce. So that's really good. So those are the ones I'll quickly comment on. There's many others. Mark? I wish I had more time, sorry. <laughs> yeah, very quickly, I'll go back to my comment. Um, this is something that I always mention when I'm giving classes. People think that the DNS only works when you have an URL on your address bar. So that's where the DNS exists. And you go, you type, and that's the DNS, right? But the DNS operates when you find something on a search engine. The DNS exists when you're operating uh, any app, pretty much, because they use DNS routing to, to actually function. So uh, these protocols, they exist everywhere. It doesn't matter if you're using it through an app, if you're using it on, on your microwave, or whatever you're using. And we don't do enough to explain this to users. So they think that this is a very specific thing. Oh, it's about having a domain name. It's not that. It's an entire system that sort of runs the internet. So people can't appreciate the importance of it because they don't understand that it's not just owning your name dots anything. Thank you. Okay, big applause to everyone. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Claudio. Gracias, Jose. Gracias, Sandy. Muchas gracias a todos. Y I promise next time I will book more time. Thank you so much, Chris.